Thank you so much for having me back. Um, I'm going to be talking about building resilience despite the teenage brain. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the teenage brain. If you've heard me talk before, some of the content will be similar, but it's important content to always hear because there's only a few things that we really need to do and we just gotta make sure we're actually doing it. So I'm just gonna sh share my screen here. A couple of disclaimers. Um, I'm a cry baby, it's a good chance I'm gonna cry. Chances increase later it gets at night. So put that out there, especially when I'm talking about other kids. Um, but I'm so happy to see so many of you here tonight because this is a very important topic. And if you're hearing things again that you've heard me talk about before, there's a reason why. So just to recap with anxiety, it's the most common mental health concern in our children and for adults as well. And there's been major increases in the past decade. It's only spiked since COVID. So even before COVID, it, we were seeing anxiety at huge epidemic levels, but COVID, it's just grown exponentially. Now, it's not something that they outgrow. Anxiety actually gets worse over time, not better. And it's the leading reason why kiddos are going to emergency rooms and for and hospitalizations. And unfortunately, when we wait, it's harder. I always say it's going to cost you more tomorrow than it is today pretty much anything when it comes to our kids. We've got to get on top of things. And certainly that's true for anxiety. And especially as they start getting into tween and teen years, because teens specifically are so susceptible to, for developing anxiety. And so it's really important that we're addressing this sooner than later. But even if you've got a teenager, I do, my oldest is in grade 11, we can still treat anxiety any, at any time. But untreated anxiety, it's the leading predictor of depression in our teens. So it usually starts as anxiety and it turns into depression. And then it goes on into adulthood. And, and it definitely is harder as we're adults. We can still change the brain and we can still manage and treat our anxiety. It's just certainly harder. Um, but there is a silver lining. Anxiety can be prevented and it's the most treatable disorder out there. So that's why I'm so happy to have so many people here because if you've got the right tools and the right know-how, it's not really a problem. So over the past decade, I've developed this anxiety compass. Um, it's a program just kind of giving a roadmap for how do we help kiddos manage their anxiety. Um, I don't have time to go through all of it tonight. You're going to get an overview of the most important pieces. So just a recap of what anxiety is, we've got this pre-built system to protect us. We see something that's going to eat us. We're either going to fight or run away, right? And, and when, when we realize we can't fight, and we can't run anymore, that's when we go into freeze mode. So this is a really simplified view. We see something scary, we see a threat, and in our brain, that amygdala, if you can see that little pink thing right in the brain, it's about the size and shape of an almond, and we actually have two. That's a key part of our emotional network in our brain. So we see danger, and it releases adrenaline from um, uh, hormones in our brain out into our body so that adrenaline, so our adrenal glands are right here above our kidneys, that sends out adrenaline to rev up our body to prepare us for fight or flight. And we can do amazing things. You've probably heard of moms who can like flip over cars when their baby's trapped inside. I've actually know a story of two teenage girls uh, who lifted up a 3000 pound tractor off their dad. It had flipped over and was crushing him. Like literally a minute later, he would have been crushed to death. Um, but these two girls picked up this tractor. So there's an incredible amount of energy that's going through our system, right? Where it's priming up our, our system so that we can run or fight or do whatever it is we need to do to face the challenge that's in front of us. So we can't get rid of anxiety and worries. We have to have it. We can't get rid of that amygdala. We have to have it because it's there for our survival, right? And I think that that's really important because so many kids and parents just want the anxiety gone. Right. And, and when we can't get rid of it, then we start feeling helpless. And parents are like, there's nothing that works. And kids are like, I'm always going to be like this. Um, but being human means we're going to feel worries. We're going to feel stress. We're going to feel some anxiety at some point in our life. Um, earlier, they were talking about trauma. Pretty much everybody in their life is going to experience some sort of trauma. It's, it's, so it's normal. This is a really protective feeling. And, and I think that that's really important. And if we think about it, you know, the important key piece of, pieces here are it's temporary. It goes away eventually. Even if you're in the middle of a panic attack, eventually that panic attack is going to subside. So it's temporary and it's not dangerous. It wouldn't make sense for our body to hyperventilate on itself, right? Or to um, cause heart problems on itself in that moment when it's trying to protect ourselves. So I think that that's really important. 
yes, lots of cortisol in the body can lead to heart failure and other difficulties, but it's when we're not using the energy that's in our body properly. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So worries are to be expected. Um, there's developmentally appropriate fears. You know, when our kids first started going to daycare or school, it was normal to be separated, you know, having that separation anxiety, because I don't know if this adult here is going to protect me from being eaten really right you know I know my parents are going to protect me from danger I don't know about this person so that makes sense switching schools our high school kiddos who are transitioning to university or to adulthood that's a huge transition starting a new job new relationships those are all appropriate so why are we here why are we talking about anxiety when when it's normal it can be really helpful the problem is it becomes a disorder when there's no end. So normal worries, there's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end. But, but it's a problem when there's no end, right? It's just on and on and on. So those amyg that amygdala in our brain is just setting off alarms all the time. It's kind of like a fire alarm, a faulty fire alarm that's always sending off alarms when you just burn toast. Now, here's the problem. The brain can't tell the difference between a real threat, like we're about to get eaten by a tiger and I've got a math test or that girl just looked at me funny or somebody posted something on social media. The body is, and the brain is going to react the exact same way as if there was a predator right there about to eat us, right? So all of those things are happening in our body and in our brain. And so it becomes really hard, you know, if you are trying to talk to a crazed mother with her, her baby caught in a car, there's no rationalizing. And so there's no rationalizing either, even if we're just worried about an exam. So kids start to worry themselves just with their own thoughts. So even just thinking something stressful is enough to trigger that amygdala. And when that amygdala goes, everything fires up again, right? And so the physical symptoms start to become a problem because then, especially our teens, they start worrying about, I don't want people to see me turning red. I don't want them seeing me sweaty. I, I can't go to school because I've got a stomach ache and I'm scared to throw up, right? So those physical symptoms become so uncomfortable for them that, that it's just intensifying the stress because now they're worried about that it's going to re-trigger something's wrong and the alarms are going to go off and on and on it goes creating this vicious cycle now i take a trans diagnostic approach meaning i don't really give labels yes we've got you know generalized anxiety and social anxiety actually we're all social socially anxious beings because if we weren't part of a tribe we would be eaten right our brain hasn't changed much in hundreds of thousands of years. And so the world was a very different place then. And we really had to be with our tribe to be able to survive. Um, there's phobias, you know, there's kids who are scared of needles or dentists or going to school or presenting in front of others or being around friends. Some, some kiddos are just scared of everything, but it doesn't really matter. Anxiety is anxiety is anxiety. So it's essentially, when we're looking at a definition, anxiety is essentially we get sucked in something scary, it becomes too much, it overwhelms our resources. And here's the most important piece. It's the belief that I can't handle it. So that's what anxiety is telling us is I can't handle it. And the way we respond is really based on how we perceive the demands, right? And if we feel that this situation way outweighs any resources that we have to handle it, they believe that they can't manage it. And that's the problem. And so there's this fear of uncertainty, what's going to happen, and I can't handle it, and I need you. And that's going to be really important for us to think about. I'm not going to go into causes. We know it's a combination of genetics and environment, but it's really not very helpful to look at, at what's going on. Um, we are all predisposed to anxiety. It's just part of being human, part of trying to stay alive and stay, stay safe. So I think that that's really important. Um, but I do want to talk about the teenage brain. And this is true even for our tweens. So, you know, as they start hitting, my younger one is 11. She's part of this uh, group as well, our tweens and teens. So there's a few things going on. As they get older, they are growing into adult bodies, right? And so they start wanting to be treated like adults and wanting more autonomy and more respect, um, showing a little bit more attitude because they are becoming, you know, physically adults, but their brain is not developing. 
it's actually at its weakest. It's under construction. And even, you know, an eight-year-old can usually make better decisions than an 18-year-old. I'm not going to get too much into that, but a lot of the things that we look at are the executive functions. So these are the high-level sort of functions in the brain that help us get started on things, even if we don't want to remember our chores, remember our homework, problem solved, regulate our emotions, regulate our behaviors. Um, what should we prioritize? You know, I should do my homework before I go and play Xbox or whatever it is. I don't even know if they have Xboxes anymore, but whatever. Technology is always changing, but, but it helps us with judgment and planning and regulating our emotions. And as you can see, you know, the purple and these green parts um, up here, but mostly the purple and blue, that's the more matured piece, right? So if you look at this green part up here, it's still not very developed. And that's where our judgment is. So the parts of the brain that probably frustrate you the most, you know, if you're always saying like for 15 years, I've been telling you to brush your teeth, you brush your teeth every single day. Why do I have to keep reminding you to brush your teeth? That's this part of the brain. It's the last part of the brain to develop. And if you've had to spend 15 years reminding them, you've created a dependency trap that they're not thinking on their own. Now, this is really frustrating because it gets even more wonky in between teenage years. And so for typically developing boys, it actually doesn't develop until 30s, um, girls, 20s. Um, if you've got a diagnosis like ADHD for boys, it's more like 40 before it fully develops, if it fully develops. So we got to really think about, you know, their capacity to make good decisions. If they're with friends, their capacity to make good decisions goes out the window because it's all based on this is going to be awesome, not thinking about how dangerous or the consequences of everything. Now, there's a couple of things. In the teenage brain, it's at its most powerful. There's an overgrowth of all these new neural pathways. So they have this amplified capacity to learn quickly. Um, memories are easier to form, right? They're making memories, memories that last longer even than adults. So the brain's at its peak efficiency. This is the best time for you to invest in talents, to do you know, remediation for learning. Um, learning to cope with emotional issues, even IQ, IQ can change. So it's at its most powerful in these teenage years. But the problem is it's still under construction. The brain is only 80% developed and the limbic system, that's the reward seeking part of the brain, it's developing even faster than our judgment making brain. And so that's why if you're ever telling, asking your kids, like, what were you thinking? They probably weren't. They were probably thinking, how many likes is this going to get on Instagram or Snapchat or whatever they're on, right? They're so motivated by that because that reward system is so much stronger than the good thinking part of their brain. It actually takes them longer to think about, you know, is it a good decision to set your hair on fire? they actually have to think about it. Eight-year-olds and adults automatically, like, no, bad idea. Teens actually have to think about it. Um, so there's this overabundance of gray matter. That's the basic building block of brains, our neurons for learning, for our thoughts, perceptions, you know, all of those kinds of things. But we have an undersupply of white matter. And white matter is what moves communication through the brain. So the ability for the brain to talk to itself. And guess what? The thinking part of the brain is cut off, right? So there's not very good connections to the thinking part of the brain. So there's this 20% gap in its wiring. And so what do we see? Huge mood swings, irritability, impulsiveness, explosiveness, um, difficulties with attention, um, relationship disruptions, especially with adults, not following through, more risky types of behaviors, um, more difficulties with anxiety, mood changes as well. So serotonin and dopamine, you know, the things that make us feel good and instill our motivation are kind of out the window. They go, they decrease in our teenage years and stress hormones increase and the hormones that help sort of balance all the stress in adult brains actually intensifies the stress in the teenage brain. So they are really susceptible and they're driven by emotion, not reason. So as much as you're trying to rationalize and reason with them, it's probably in one ear and out the other. And the brain, it signals danger, but their frontal lobes aren't responding. And so they're literally like deer caught in headlights. And I actually have stories of kiddos who get themselves into so much 
danger because they're maybe scared of getting in trouble, not realizing what they're, I mean, the story that I've got is this happened many years ago and it was in the States, you know, star uh, quarterback uh, football player who had gone to a party, had been drinking, needed to get home, was terrified of getting in trouble because he was kind of on his last, you know, if, if he gets any more, gets into any more trouble, his parents were going to kick him off the, pull him from the football team. So he's terrified of getting in trouble and getting caught. So he's had to walk through a forest to get home. He was taking a, a shortcut through the forest. And at one point, like he had seen the cars, he could see the highway. And at one point there were police lights that had gone down the highway. He panicked, right? As kids do, they think everything is about themselves. And so he went deeper into the woods, even though he should have been, you know, walking, staying by the highway, but he got so lost um, in, in the woods, he, they couldn't find him, you know, through the night. They found him the next day. He was still alive, but frozen solid. He had such bad, um, not freezer burn, frostbite, <laughs> um, that they actually had to airlift him to a severe burns unit and he lost all of his fingers, couldn't play football again. So not thinking, right? He knew that there was danger, but it was the wrong danger. And that's the thing. They're so vulnerable. They learn quickly, but they're not necessarily focusing on the right thing. And so they end up making really poor decisions. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about how much our kids are stressed because this is the number one contributor to anxiety. I don't want to look too much into causes, but I think knowing the changes in the brain, decrease in serotonin and dopamine, they're already susceptible to anxiety. And then we add more stress on top of that. And that's going to be a problem. Now, again, when, when they're stressed, our kids are acting out or zoning out. So our generation is more stressed. These kids are way more stressed than any other generation. And a lot of it has to do with the amount of information that they have through social media, through the inter internet. You know, we've got crises happening all the time. They've been hearing nothing about wars and school shootings. And even though it's in other parts of the world, their brain has a really hard time. Even the teenage brain has a really hard time separating that's there, this is here, Add on all everything else that's going on in their life, busy schedules, tests, sports, relationships, fighting with parents about brushing their teeth or, or everything else. All of these things compound and it's a big piece of all of the stress is how much screen time that they have. And we've got this world of competition. They have to be effortlessly perfect. It's not just enough to do good in school and get the best grades and be the best, you know, chess player and debate person and getting valedictorian and volunteering. Like they have to be perfect in so many different areas and exceed all expectations. And, you know, just the competition to get into universities and things like that, it can be really hard. Like I literally work with grade four students who are worried about what university they're going to get into. I was never thinking about university. Like <laughs> not at that age, right? And so it's really hard. There's just so many things going on. But just knowing that social media, the more, more access they have, they're more anxious, less happy, and it does contribute to lower grades. And just all of the, the expectations and the messages that they get about beauty and, and relationships and, oh my gosh, you know, they're best of friends. And they're just seeing the, the picture perfect sort of things that people are posting, thinking that's people's real life. And it's really hard for them. So I think that that's just one piece to keep in the back of mind. I can do a whole workshop just on screen time, but I just wanted to, knowing that we have a little bit of time, I just wanted to quickly touch on that. The biggest thing though, is the adult traps. And this is something you have direct control over. And this is kind of what I want to focus on for right now. And probably for, for most of the talk today, I don't want to make people feel guilty. I always say to parents, you know, they should tell you as soon as you have your newborn, here's your baby plus five pounds of guilt compounded daily for the rest of your life. So it's not meant to make you guys feel guilty or anything like that, but it's just to be aware of what are some of the traps that I fall into? And look, I'm an expert on parenting everybody else's kids. I'm an expert on anxiety and I fall into these traps too, right? My, when my kids listen and they're always listening to, to my presentations, they'll be like, hey, remember when you said this and this and this? Why do you not listen to your own advice? So I fall into it too. 
The first trap is catastrophic language, where we provide safety information like, hey, kiddo, remember to lock the door behind me. Just don't open it for anyone. I'll be back in an hour, right? That's good safety language. But we add on the catastrophic language. Like, otherwise, you know, if you um, don't lock up, somebody's going to come in and break in and they're going to steal you and they're going to steal all our stuff, right? We add on that language. And that, our words are really influential. Um, good safety language. Hey, kiddo, put your seatbelt on, period. But we add, otherwise, you're going to go flying through the windshield and smash your head in and be quadriplegic for the rest of your life, right? We always add that, that catastrophic language. And for an anxious kid and a stressed out kid, that can be really nerve wracking. And they start picking up the world is a dangerous place. All of our, ah, oh, oh, you're too high, slow down, you know, eek, be careful that's really dangerous too. Yes, we have to protect our kiddos and we have to minimize risks for students, but what ends up happening is they don't learn to take any risks. Everything is dangerous and we're telling them to be careful all the time. So they're believing, I can't handle it. I can't do anything on my own, right? And that becomes, and even this is nerve wracking. When I, I never drive with my mother anymore because she'll, you know, hammer on the fake brake on the passenger side and grab the dashboard. <laughs> You know, even she doesn't even have to say anything. It's just her body language. And I start getting stressed. It really stresses us out uh, when we're overcritical. When we're overcritical, kids are feeling like they're never successful enough or never good enough. And it doesn't even have to be this extreme where we're always on their case that you're not good enough. It's just, hey, Johnny, remember to put your shoes away. Hey, dude, what are you doing with your dishes? Um, but did you walk the dogs? Like even those little reminders, it's nag, 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 but it feels like nothing is ever good enough, right? We're always correcting something. When they're babies, we're all like, oh, you're so cute and beautiful and everything you do is awesome. But as soon as they start walking and talking, 95% of what comes out of our mouth is usually some form of corrective feedback right? Even if they do the dishes, we're correcting, oh, you missed the spot, right? They wipe the counter, but oh, you missed the spot. They're feeling like they can't do enough. Conversely, you know, we're always rewarding being the best at everything too. And that can be really hard. I'm um, blaming genetics. I hear this all the time, right? We, we say it's a, um, imbalance in the brain, which by the way, was debunked like in the eighties. We know even with depression, there's no chemical imbalance. Um, yes, there is a genetic component when we look at anxiety, but saying stories like, oh, they came by it. Honestly, I was anxious and my parents are anxious. My whole family is anxious. They're just an anxious kid. That's not helpful because it starts to set in this identity of I'm anxious. Therefore, there's nothing I can do about it. And there is stuff we can do about it. So we don't want to do that because we don't, especially in teenage years, they really start to internalize that. And a lot of my teens actually get angry at me when I say we can like manage this anxiety. You don't have to be anxious all the time. They get mad at me because it's become part of their identity and we don't want to do that. Um, we ask leading questions. So leading questions is usually more about what you're worried about than what they're worried about. And I, I remember when my oldest was in grade nine, she'd made a comment about sitting, um, sitting in the hallway, reading a book for lunch. And I was like, oh, who are you with? She's like, no, I was just reading by myself. So then all of a sudden my anxiety is like, oh my gosh, is she having social problems? And so then I started asking her every day, like, who are you going to eat lunch with today? And then at the end of the day, who did you hang out with today? And it became to the point that one day she was like, mom, stop asking. Like, this is stressing me out. So I created this problem with her. And, and later we, we realized like she was just having social overload. She just needed, we're both ADHD. So she's just like, I was just an overload. I just needed time by myself. And I just just wanted to read. That was her way of self-regulating. So it was my anxiety that there were social problems going on. So asking leading questions or we're answering their questions. When is the fire drill? What's the substitute? You know, are they going to know all my accommodations that I need? What time are you going to be home? Do you have your cell phone? Can I text you if you're going to be home? If you're not going to be home, who's going to be home? Who's coming over? You know, kids are anxious. Kids especially are start asking all of these questions. Answering those questions aren't helping. The prefrontal cortex wants information. The amygdala wants to cut the Wi-Fi off to our prefrontal cortex. So the more information it has, we start just spinning its wheels so that anxiety can take over, right? And, and 
It's this fear of uncertainty that I can't handle this uncertainty, so I need predictability. And so they just get overwhelmed. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that in a second. Um, trying to get them to calm, right? It's okay. Don't panic. It's not a big deal, right? Just calm down. It sends the message that A, anxious feelings are bad, which they aren't. I've already told you anxious feelings are normal. And, and so we're telling them not to worry, but we're minimizing their feelings. And when we're saying there's nothing to worry about, you know, anytime we're reassuring them that it's going to be okay, it actually maintains anxiety because they're going to start to rely on us to feel better. Anxiety wants comfort and it wants information predictability. So if we're doing, if we're giving reassurance and predictability and information, we're doing exactly what anxiety wants. They're never learning for themselves how to cope. And it becomes this compulsion. And I've got so many high school girls, more, I mean, boys do, do too, but girls especially, I've got so many right now that I'm working with who can't go to school until their mother tells them that their hair is perfect, that their outfit is perfect. They need this reassurance to feel better. They're not problem solving and figuring it out on their own, right? And so we do things like that. And, and we're minimizing too, when we're saying not to worry about it, you know, we're minimizing their feelings and sending the message that they have control over how they feel. None of us have control over how we feel. If we all had control over how we feel, we'd be happy to go lucky every single day. We don't. How we respond is where we've got the choice, but not how we feel. But there's lots of things that we do. We might check under their bed. See, there's no monsters here for younger kids, but maybe for older kids too. Um, I actually have a lot of teenagers who are still sleeping in their parents' room. Like I said, we think that it's gonna go away and they're gonna outgrow it. But I tell you what, there's so many teens still sleeping in their, in their parents' bedrooms. I still have a few teenagers who are still wearing pull-ups for bowel movements. So we got to be careful with this. Um, maybe we're checking lights. Maybe we're checking their, their temperature, right? We're checking their uh, homework. Reassuring is never going to help. If you've done it once, you're going to have to do it again. They're never actually going to feel better. The anxiety is only going to worsen it. The only thing that's really going to happen is you're probably going to exhaust yourself or get frustrated yourself having to do this all the time. So like I said, saying don't worry doesn't work. They get stuck in the constant need for reassurance and they're not developing any uh, skills. They're not developing their problem solving skills, right? And it's impossible for them to not think. You know, if I said, don't think of your left hand, whatever you do, don't think of your left hand. You've probably not ever thought of your left hand unless you cut it, right? But as soon as I say that, your first thought is about your left hand, even just for a split second. So we, we, we wanna make sure that we're not doing that and not minimizing how they're feeling. The other problem is, too, kids can't see the things from the same perspective. So if they're stressed out, if they're freaking out, if they're having a panic attack, literally the Wi-Fi to their rational thinking, calming down brain is offline. They are in survival mode. Their body is jacked up with so much adrenaline and cortisol and, and their alarm, emotional brain is just saying danger, danger, danger. They're not hearing anything you say anyway. It's literally going in one, one ear and out the other. So any reassurances that you're doing, you know, it's just very reactive. They're not hearing it anyway. So we, we just got to think about that. Again, anything that you do to give certainty, predictability, comfort, we're actually making anxiety worse. We're participating in exactly what anxiety does. And so accommodations, I'll just quickly go over this. If you guys have an IPP, IEP, LSP, whatever you guys call them for accommodations, um, great, fantastic for dyslexia or, you know, any learning disability, autism, ADHD, fantastic. But with anxiety, actually, the accommodations are very enabling. We're making the anxiety worse, especially when we're letting kids avoid anxiety. So the wrong types of accommodations can be really problematic. And there's a few things that we do, even if you don't have an IPP, just maybe there's some behaviors that you're doing to accommodate. Two types, one is participating in anxiety. So you're checking. So maybe making sure the doors are locked, for example, or checking homework before it goes to school tomorrow to make sure it's perfect. Um, anything that we say, it's okay. Kiddo, if you don't want to go to the sleepover, don't worry, just stay home. If you don't want to go to the outing, the field trip, don't worry, just stay home. We're assisting in the avoidance or reassuring. We're participating in the anxiety or we're modifying things so we prevent the anxiety in the first place. And then we feel good, right? Like, phew, I made my kid feel better or we avoided that panic attack. 
aren't we so good? We're actually making it worse whenever we do these types of things. So if we're accommodating, if we're doing things differently for the sake of anxiety, we actually know that anxiety is more impairing and more severe with poor treatment outcomes in the long term. So we got to be really careful. So I'm always asking parents, what are you doing for your kids that they could be doing for themselves? And this is true if you have an anxious kiddo or not. So if you've got an anxious kiddo, what are you doing for anxiety's sake to avoid anxiety? That's a problem. But even if you don't have an anxious kiddo, you know, are you reminding them every day to brush their teeth? Are you the one checking in to make sure they've got homework or tests? When are they going to learn those skills? If they're not learning it now, they're not going to learn it as an adult. Well, they will when they get fired from their first job, right? We don't want that to happen. It's going to cost them more tomorrow. So we got to start thinking about, you know, some of those things. These are just an example. And I can send you guys the handout so you don't have to worry about too much, you know. But if you're not going places, if you're leaving the light on still for them at night because they're scared, right? If um, I still have some, it, it's incredible, you know, some of my teenagers who still can't be on a different floor from the parents, you know, or somebody else on the same floor as them, let alone staying home alone, right? That's just too scary. Um, my oldest daughter still doesn't like, it's dark out now, right? And she still doesn't like going outside to walk the dogs, like after four o'clock, because it starts getting dark. She's like, it's all murdery out there. And I'm like, okay, well, go and see, tell me when you get back, if you got murdered, right? If you're murdered, well, there's nothing we can do. I know that that's morbid, but, but that's the kind of thing, you know, like we, we've minimized, um, Otherwise, if we say anything else, but this is a big thing, especially when I see the, the teens, I'll just give you a minute to, to read this. Right. Parents do so much all the time. And that's a problem. Um, I remember, you know, I don't even think my parents knew what grade I was in. I actually had fake ID because my dad messed up my birthday by a lot. And I had government military issued ID um, that made me a couple years older. It was fantastic. Once I was, you know, able to go to the bars at 16 with my 18 year old's uh, ID, they had no clue what was going on in my life. Right. But I was successful. It's these, if we helicopter too much, we're actually impairing brain development. So we got to be careful. So anytime yet yeah, kiddo, I'll check over your homework. Um, you know what? Oh, you're having friendship fires. We probably don't call it that with our tweens and teens, but you're having problems with a friend or with a teacher. I'm going to go in, I'm going to go in and talk to them. Um, you don't want to ride the school bus, dude. I will give you a ride. No problem. You don't want to go to school. Hey, why don't you go to school for just a little bit? Call me if you get sick or call me if things aren't going well, I'll pick you up and bring you home. Whenever we're doing these things, we're telling our kids that you can't handle it. But guess what? That's exactly what anxiety already is telling them. They already feel like I can't handle it. And so it becomes a problem when we're always jumping in, we're creating this dependency trap. And so we're robbing them of critical developmental opportunities to tolerate discomfort to learn how to manage that uncertainty and that discomfort, how to manage their worries, how to manage challenging situations. I remember the first time my daughter, the, my older one who had problems with her coaches in U12. So she would have been 11 years old. She was the one, if she had a problem with the coach, she had to go talk to the coaches. It wasn't our job. They need to be accountable to multiple different people in their life, right? So if we're always jumping in, we're robbing them of those opportunities and we're actually changing their brain development because they're not making those problem-solving connections, conflict resolution, whatever the moment is, whatever the situation is, they're not able to do those. And anxiety becomes ingrained. And then they start believing I will never change, right? And they're more vulnerable because they've never had the opportunity to experience that I can cope with this. I can cope with this discomfort. So the number one thing that they need to learn is how to manage the experience of anxiety. Anxiety becomes a disorder when, when they can't manage the feelings that come with it. Right. And so they have to manage the fear. They have to manage the experience of anxiety. It has nothing to do with the trigger. The trigger, like I said, it could be a dentist. It could be a dog. It could be the math teacher. It could be um, tornadoes. It could be, you know, what's happening in Ukraine. It could be so many different things. It doesn't matter. They need to manage the discomfort and the uncertainty. That's what they need to do if we're going to work on this. 
Um, I just have a quick little video to, to show. Hopefully this works. I actually got to share my sound. Give me a second. Not that there's a lot of sound. Well, yeah, no sounds important. This is from the movie Ray. I assume you all know, but he's blind, just in case you don't know that. I hear you too, Mama. You're right there. And had she jumped in, see, I'm going to cry, I'm a crybaby. Had she jumped in, he never would have learned. Like, who knows? We might have never had Ray Charles, right? If she was always jumping in and babying him. And this is kind of what we got to start thinking about. How can they start doing things for themselves? They don't always need us. So how we respond makes all the difference. So maybe you are looking for strategies on how they need to work on their skills. I'm going to tell you the secret. If you change how you respond to anxiety when it shows up and to stress when it shows up, you're going to help them build their skills already, right? There, he was forced to, in, the, in that Ray clip, he was forced to figure it out. And then he was able to, you know, experience the world in a whole new way, but he had to figure it out for himself. So he was already in that just 30 seconds, so much more resilient by doing it just because mom didn't even have to do anything. She just didn't respond. So we need to become a, a effective emotion coaches, right? And so it's not us, uh, the, the way the analogy that I love around coaches is they're there to support and encourage, but they can't go out onto the field and, and, and do the play for the kids. They can't go up onto the stage and do the recital, right? If, if they're the violin teacher, they are there for support, but ultimately it's the kids who have to go out there and do it themselves. And so being an effective coach first in the heat of the moment, we're giving them space for regulation. If they're coming home upset and stressed out or angry, parents usually jump in. What's wrong? Tell me what's wrong. What did you do? What happened? Or if they, you know, got in trouble and were at the principal's office, what were you at the principal's office? Bah, 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 bah. We start drilling them. But when that prefrontal cortex is offline, if there's any emotion, even boredom, is enough to make that prefrontal cortex go offline, we are just overwhelming them and they're not able to process anything and nothing's going to be helpful. So the first thing is just create space, just sit with them, right? I remember the first time um, I broke up with a very serious boyfriend who's now actually my husband, but the first time we broke up, my, my, I, I remember very clearly my mom just came and sat down next to me on my bed 
she could have said, there's a million other fish in the sea. You're just a teenager. You're still so young. You know, you don't fuck. Like we want to, we think that we're helping our kids feel better to cheer them up, but it doesn't actually, it's just, it, it's not helping them at all. It's, we're minimizing their feelings. It's going to make it worse. Just sit with them. That's all you need to do. And, and if you feel like the need to talk, um, I'm going to go into ways to respond, but my hack is an adjective. In any situation, and I would start practicing this, even if they're coming home with something awesome, like look at my A that I got on my essay. Fantastic. Fantastic is the adjective. Hopefully there's no kids listening. I'm going to swear. Maybe I won't swear. I won't swear. I'll just, uh, just in case. Um, but I remember one, one day my daughter, my younger daughter in elementary came home last year with a friendship fire. And she's all upset, right? And part of me in my head is like, why do you keep hanging out with this girl like she's always the center of drama you're always fighting why are you guys friends right like that's in my head saying that's not going to help though all I did in that moment I was like oh fruit cake but it wasn't fruit cake it was the F word and so she was like ah because I'm not I don't usually swear so she was like and then you could just see the tension melt out of her like yeah you get me, right? She didn't say you get me, but she she knew with that word, with the adjective that I was listening and I understood her. And that's a huge piece. Your kids got to know, I know you listen, but your kids got to know that you are listening to them and that they feel understood. And so when we try to advice give or lecture or jump in with anything else, we're taking away that opportunity. They're never going to feel heard. So understanding the function of emotions is really important, especially when we've got our angry, aggressive, lashing out kids. Anger isn't a primary emotion. The primary emotion underlying anger is fear. They're protecting themselves. And if you think about any time, if you hit your head on something or stubbed your toe, you probably responded with anger, like, oh, shoot, right? The pain part of your brain is triggered. And when the pain part of our brain is triggered, we get angry, we lash out. And so we might see the screaming and yelling. Maybe this is a you know, teenager yelling at his parents, but there's disappointment. Maybe there's hurt. Maybe there's fear of if I can't go out, I'm going to be the laughing stock. I'm going to be the loser, right? Who knows? It comes out as disrespect, but there's something else going under, under, underneath. So you would re can respond very differently. If you're thinking of this kid as being disrespectful and entitled and aggressive, and you can't take that tone to me, you're going to respond very differently than if you see a kid who's hurting and in pain. So we got to talk less and listen more. We always have our yeah, but, but our big butts are always getting in the way of our relationship with our kids and our ability to help them regulate and regulate their emotions. So this is a huge piece of this. So we're going to validate and acknowledge. If anything you take away, I don't care if you don't listen to anything else. The number one most important thing is just trying that adjective. If they tell you anything, reflect back. Oh man, that sucks. Ah, just dis how disappointing, right? Sex is the adjective, disappointing. Just do that, just to show them that you understand that you are listening to them. That's going to be really important. And like I said, sometimes just sitting next to them is all that you need. Because sometimes I can't remember if I had shown this picture in my last presentation. So if you have seen it, don't, don't, um, don't call out anything. But how you perceive the situation is going to be very different from how you're, especially a teenager, perceives the situation. I'm going to open up the chat here. Um, I want to see um, if I can see my chat. Oh, there it is. Throw out some ideas. What are you guys seeing? Any ideas of what this is? If you've seen it before, don't, don't answer. But I'm going to be mean. I'm going to put my mean hat, hat on here. Come on, you guys. I'm here working my butt off to present to you guys, and you can't even respect me enough to give me an answer. <laughs> That's about as mean. Face, grease. Kate, stop goofing around. David, go to the principal's office. You're always making a, you're always being class clown. No, I can't be mean. I can't be mean. A couple of ideas. Thank you for those of you who are participating. So I could yell at you, pull up your socks. You're not trying hard enough. City grid, right? you're just so unmotivated when I was your age, like we could give them, you know, all our lectures, we could be mean, 
Okay, so punishing isn't working. Well, thank you to the three of you who did try. Um, I'm gonna switch tactics here. I'm gonna be nicer. Kangaroo near the bottom. Okay, interesting, interesting. Um, do I have the next screen? No, I don't. Okay, so I'm gonna change, I'm gonna give you incentive. 20 bucks to the first person who can tell me what it is. Now I'm gonna incentivize you, right? I'm gonna add a reward. So punishment doesn't work. What if I add a reward? Anybody? Any guesses? 20 bucks? Okay, so some of you might be motivated, like, oh, I just wanna know, right? Amoebas, nice. David's still trying. Oh, a skull, maybe, maybe. So just because we're all looking at it, you can all see it, right? So I can uh, be mean and call you lazy and unmotivated and never doing anything good enough. I could try to reward you, right? But if you can't perceive it, that's not going to help. I see a cow. And unless you can see a cow, we're always going to be butting heads. We're never going to be on the same page. Now that I've said it's a cow, some of you are going to be like, oh, it's a cow. Some of you probably still can't see it. So I'm going to try. Let me see if I can outline it. So now I got to show. Oh, why is my pen not working? Can I highlight? Let's see if this will work. Oh, but not yellow. Okay, let's see if I can. Oh, it's not letting me. Okay, sorry, but here's the face. I don't know why it's not letting. Oh, now it is. Here's the cow's head. There's its eye and a little bit of shadowing down the face. Its ear. Another ear. This is its body, hind leg. Okay, so now that I've sort of drawn it out, some of you might be able to see it. Some of you still might not be able to, but unless we can see the same picture, we're always gonna be butting heads. And that creates a lot of stress, right? And, and you will always see things different from your team. That's why we wanna make sure that we're understanding that we're both seeing the cow. Because if you're seeing a cow and they're seeing a rabbit, right? It's gonna be hard. We're never gonna be on the same page. So that's an important piece. When we're looking at effective communication, we've gotta make sure that we see the same picture as them before we are able to help them at all. Now, your goal is to not escalate them further, right? Your goal is to create a calm space. If you cannot do that, if your amygdala is starting to ring, get yourself out of there. And it's okay to say, oh, my amygdala is starting to ring. I'm getting a little stressed. I'm gonna be in the kitchen or I'm gonna go for a walk, right? That's great modeling to use your words to say how you're feeling and what you're gonna to do to go self-regulate. But you can let them know, I'm gonna be there for you. When you're ready, just come and find me in the kitchen or in my bedroom or wherever I am. Um, don't take it personal. When we're upset, we, the like, kids go for the jugular, right? They are gonna say, you're the worst parent ever. I hate this family. Why was, or why was I even born? I wish I wasn't alive right? Or they'll go there. They're pulling at our heartstrings. They will say, and it's not, it, the rational brain just isn't thinking. And no, we don't want to not take those comments seriously, but we can't get sucked into it. Anxiety is kind of like a cult leader. It wants to suck everybody into it. And we get in there and we don't realize we're part of this cult. We just don't want to get sucked in. So in the moment, we're not taking it personal. We can actually say, thank you. Thank you for having this blowout right now, because now I get to work on my co-regulation skills and I get to help respond in an effective way, right? So it's just focusing on what's most important. And in the heat of the moment, the focus is our connection, my connection with you. We wanna create that safety, calm place, especially when we're looking at trauma, but even with um, anxiety. Oh man, only 10 minutes. I've got 50 slides to get through. I don't think that's gonna happen, um, but I'm gonna try. Uh, so effective response is supportive, adjective, I hear you, I understand you, I see the cow with you, and confidence. Oh man, that sucks with your friends. So what are you going to do, right? We might have a million ideas. We are a wealth of knowledge. We've had a whole life of experience to share. They don't want to hear it. They got to learn their own experience. They have to learn through their own experiences and figure things out on their own. So that's going to be really important. One of the greatest answers I don't know what's going to happen, especially if they're answering, you know, coming to you for answers. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know when the fire drill is. I don't know what time you're going to be home. I don't know who's going to be there. So on the one hand, if you do nothing else and you just learn to respond effectively, you're already going to be promoting your kids resilience. On the other hand, 
we got to make sure that we are doing things differently and our kids are doing things differently. So we want to do the opposite of what anxiety wants to do. And I'll often do a chart. Okay, so you're freaked out about going to the birthday party. What does anxiety want you to do? Stay home. What does anxiety want me to do? Let me stay home. We got to do the opposite. So what's the opposite? Go to the birthday party, right? That's where we want to get to. Um, now, we can't just talk about it. This is the thing. We can't just talk about resilience. We can't just talk about growth mindset and being brave. We could talk for 10,000 hours about learning how to swim, but I wouldn't then, after 10,000 hours of talking about it, throw a kid into the deep end and assume that they can swim. They actually have to learn through experience. 90% of what they learn is through experience. And so when they avoid things, they're not practicing, they're not growing, and they have no experience to say, hey, I can handle it, right? Because anxiety wants to tell them that they can't. When we look at resilient kids, they can respond effectively to everyday challenges and stressors. Sorry, my dogs are here, if you hear anything in the background. So when I look at the speed of recovery, first of all, it's their willingness to feel anxiety. The willingness to go to school and not know if my outfit is perfect. The willingness to go into the test and write the test, even though I'm not sure how I'm going to do. The willingness to go and ask somebody out on a date, even though I don't know if they're going to say yes, right? Or talk to my teacher about a really hard situation. I don't know what they're going to say, but it's the willingness to feel that in the first place. And so it's about doing. It's really about doing. So we want to create opportunities. And this is something that I know I've talked about before, right? And, and it's so important in everything that I do. So when I look at curing anxiety, it never goes away. So I never worry about trying to turn it down. But the, 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 the goal is, to, is when kids aren't worried about feeling anxious anymore. They're not worried about all of the discomfort of the feelings of awkwardness. Right. So there's lots of different things. So it's kind of like Captain Dan and Forrest Gump. You know, he's up there. You call this a storm. Right. It's that like, bring it, bring it on anxiety. Do your best. I'm still going to go to the sleepover. I'm still going to write my test. I'm still going to go to the trip, you know, the grade nine trip. So if I'm uncomfortable, then I know I'm on the right track right? That's what they got to get. Yes, my amygdala is rung. I get to build my resilience brain. That's where we need to get. So it's a lot of repetition doing things. So there's a couple of ways of doing this, capitalizing on current challenges. There's challenges every single day, right? So how can we capitalize on that? If they have a falling out with a friend, don't give them advice. Be there to support them, but let them figure out how are you going to handle this? If they've got a test tomorrow and they haven't studied, well, how are you going to handle this, right? We're going to be asking them, how are you going to handle it? So we want to make sure that they are figuring out these challenges. Um, and we got to optimize teachable moments. And even things like my daughter needed to go to work and she just assumes that we can always drive her. But sometimes like I have to present my husband had to go to, a, well, he didn't have to go to a hockey game, but he went to a hockey game today, right? So sorry, kiddo, like, what are you going to do? right? She did figure it out, but, but that's her being able to problem solve. So those are lifelong skills. So figuring out things as they come up. Um, so they have to experience rejection and disappointment. We're always trying to temper it. It's okay. It's not a big deal. It's not the end of the world. Try again better next time. Um, my daughter was not doing good at bio, but she's like, it doesn't even matter because I know in January, I get to make up all the quizzes. I get to do them all over again. I'm like, oh, but you're not really learning that feeling of, oh, I didn't study. I should have studied. She didn't learn a lesson there, right? And so I, I hate these second chances sometimes. Sometimes they're helpful, but sometimes I'm like, you got to feel that, oh, I should have, you know, studied. Um, so without softening it, getting them to take ownership. If they've lost a game, you know, I see it all the time. My girls play ringette it's okay, your, your, your D was just off their game or your goalie was just off their game. No, this is a team. What was your role? You know, where were you for your goalie? So looking at that ownership, what could I do to help support my team? Um, and, and being able to make a difference as well, even with themselves, with others and within the situation. So we wanna capitalize on those regular opportunities. And we want to do that on the one hand, but we also wanna create opportunities 
getting them to do hard things every single day. I would make it a rule. Every day there's something hard. So maybe you're creating challenges, right? Um, even just like a, a, a riddle that they have to solve or some, some direct experience knowing that, hey, I can handle this, right? We can work together. Maybe it's a team project, you know, with siblings or something or a family thing, but working through things on their own. And, and that can be really helpful. Even, you know, the toothpick, you've got like six toothpicks in this design and you can move one to make a new design, you know, working through those kinds of things, anything hard, that's going to build the perseverance. Embracing mistakes, that can be really helpful. A lot of our teens worry about making mistakes in the classroom for the educators here. You know, maybe you have a mistake wall where everybody is writing their mistake that they made for the day. What did they learn? And we're going to celebrate it. But you can do it at home too. What was your mistake of the day, right? How did you handle that? What was the experience like? What did you learn? What can you do a little bit more tomorrow? Having a family meeting, you know, as at dinner time can be really helpful. Um, so it's not about the mistake. It's about what are you going to do next? You know, so for my daughter with the bio, what are you going to do for your next quiz, right? Um, looking at all of those types of things is going to be important. So it's not getting stuck in this mistake. I actually love, you know, I do a lot of test anxiety things with, with my teenagers. I love looking through their mistakes. They're looking at their mistakes like, ah, to beat themselves up. But I help them look for, okay, this is fantastic. This was a unit test. I'm going to look at my mistakes. This is my study guide for my final exam. It's telling me exactly what I need to study more for next time, right? I don't need to really study the things I already know. These are the things that I'm going to focus on. So it's being able to look at how do I take this and move on? We do it all the time. You know, kids, when they're learning to walk, they learn how to balance to be able to walk. When they're riding a bike, they learn how to balance through every mistake. And so we just want to capitalize on those. The only other thing that I want to say too, is we look at these great, this is Michael Phelps. Um, we, we look at these amazing stories, these amazing success stories, and, and the way that they're presented, especially the overnight sensations, right? The people who just made they came from the Bronx, inner city, you know, and now they're successful at whatever that they, whatever they do. What we don't hear about is the support team that's around them, helping them. And we don't talk about that enough. And in every success story, every Cinderella story, there's a team of people in the backgrounds. Even Cinderella, she had her mice, right? She had to have her mice and her horses and her pumpkin and her fairy godmother to make it all happen. And a lot of our kids don't ask for help. And that's an important part of resilience, not anxiety help. I need you because I can't do it myself, right? It's a matter of, I have tried, and I tell my girls all the time, you know, especially with this learned helplessness, you figure out three different ways of doing it. If you're still stuck, then you come talk to me. And they do, they figure out, okay, mom, I've tried this, even with sibling rivalry, right? I, I've tried this with my sister. I tried walking away and I tried doing this. And now I just need some ideas. I'm not jumping in there to end the fight. I'm now going to brainstorm some new ideas. If I have to, then I will. But they both have to agree that it's now time for mom to step in. So asking for help is really important. Our resilient kids know to how to handle challenges, but they also are brave enough to ask help when they know that they actually need help. And so it's making sure, you know, if they know how to do things themselves, they're doing it for themselves, but knowing when to ask for appropriate guidance. Guidance. Um, the only other thing that I want to say is worry is really strong. That amygdala is right next to our hippocampus. Our hippocampus is our memory stores. And so anxiety is really good at making us forget the times that we've been successful. And our brain actually has this negativity bias where we latch on to all of the negative memories, the scary memories, the sad, angry memories, all of the things that we think of as sort of bad memories. Our brain holds on to them because they're essential for survival where we don't really have the same storage um, for successes and for the good things that have happened in our life. And so what ends up happening is our, our prefrontal cortex, rational thinking brain, remembering all of the good things, it's cut off. And so we're only remembering our failures. And so we want to create memory bridges of times that we were successful. And so one visual that I love doing, and you can do this, I even do it with my high school daughter is on the, you have your three circles and I write everything on a sticky. I've got a wall of stickies over here. 
So I would write all of your successes, things that kids can do perfectly. And even if it's, you know, a video game, the things that they love doing, reading, riding their bike, driving, whatever they are doing, you're going to put that in pen. Because when you get to that point, you usually are successful. You don't have to relearn it. Maybe you're expanding your learning, but you're successful with that. Everything else that's hard, put it on a sticky. And so what ends up happening is, so everything's hard on a sticky. It's temporary. We're going to move it. So what are we going to work on? So maybe we're working on managing social anxiety, specifically putting my hand up in class or complimenting someone, making friends, right? What is it that we're going to work on? Maybe it's being able to go into the classroom to write a test and not in the office, right? We're going to put that on the working on it. And when it becomes easy, we're going to move it over to the success and then we're going to write it in pen. So working on something every single day. Um, my daughter had a lot of social anxiety in junior high and uh, we actually had a bravery jar and we brainstormed a hundred different things, you know, compliment someone that you don't normally talk to, um, buy a friend their favorite chocolate bar and give it to them. Hey, I was at the store, grab myself a chocolate bar, I was thinking of you. Um, saying hi to someone in the hallway, looking at people in the hallway and smiling as you're walking down, right? We put those things, we broke them into little individual papers, put them in the bravery jar. So when she walked out the house every morning, she picked a thing out of the jar. What, what is my thing that I'm going to do today? And then I did have a reward after because we need to get their buy-in um, for her, just literally some licorice and an episode of Modern Family. And she was super happy, right? And so that's what she was motivated to do. So the most important thing of everything that I've talked about is you responding effectively but on the other hand, looking for these opportunities and creating opportunities for them to be doing things and figuring things out on their own. Fast and Furious. Um, I do have a couple of podcasts if you're interested in hearing more, learning more from me. One is Parents of the Year. It's just my husband and I talking about various issues. This week is, um, should we fight? Should parents fight in front of their kids. Um, so lots of different ranges of what we're talking about in parenting. And then Overpowering Emotions is predominantly me, I do sometimes have guests, but I'm talking about all things anxiety. Um, I'm still, even though we're in December, I'm still talking about back to school success because there's so many things school related that's stressing our kids out. Um, and I started that in August and we're still in December talking about that, but it's all things about anxiety and emotion regulation. So if you want to check those out, do. We have a few minutes left for questions. And I'll send you guys those handouts so you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, any questions? One thing I will say, I just actually presented at a school on Friday and um, the teachers were just like, well, we've got all these accommodations in our IPPs and you know, how do we get parents to buy into this tough love? I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not tough love right? It's not suck it up, you're on your own. I think I just wanted to make sure I clarified that. We are still there. We are really supportive. We're very validating. We are there for them, but we're not solving things for them. We're not trying to make them feel better or, or, or solve things. I think that that's really important. Yes, it is being recorded and should be available to everyone to watch again. Yeah, I'm glad it was helpful. And if you think of questions, I know sometimes in the moment we don't process and think of things. Um, I'm happy to, if you pass them on to the school and they can pass them on to me, I'm happy to answer any questions that you think of. Or even you might go, you know, through your week and you're like, ah, oh, this is a, a situation I'm really struggling with. I'm happy to answer any questions that come up. Can you say a bit more about how to regulate our own emotions when confronted by a big challenge with our kids or students? So yeah, that's key. If you can, uh, one thing I didn't talk about, oh, I don't have my big water bottle, but we'll just use this little water bottle. Um, we got to think of this as our, our, our ability to regulate. So to be able to regulate, we need a full cup. Our teens might have a half a cup barely right but think of babies babies don't have any capacity to self-regulate at all so parents have to do it all right we are doing all of the regulating for our kids they cry so we warm them up we rock them we feed them we dry them whatever it is that we need to do so teenagers might have half a capacity so we have to fill that other part up and that's a problem when 
they want to be adults. We think that they should be adults, but they only have half the capacity. So I love that you asked that question because we also need to fill up the rest of their capacity. And if we are anxious, our nervous systems talk to each other. And so we're just going to escalate their piece. Um, right now, if you don't have the skills, I would say proactively create a cue you know, for my daughter, she would say puppy. Like if I'm on my computer, this is one of my traps. If I'm on my computer working on a report and my kids are coming and bugging me, I'm a little snappy. And so my kids will say puppy. And that's like, oh yeah. Okay. I can see that I'm not, you know, able to regulate right now, but maybe talk about proactively when everybody's calm to say, just, you know, if I'm stressed, I'm going to leave. I'm going to say my key word and I'm going to leave. I would say, just get out of there at first. Right. And, and give, you know, say puppy going for a walk or whatever that is. Um, if you have a partner that could be great. Like if you can take team off of each other, that can usually be really helpful. Um, but I would say you got to go and do your own work before you get your kids to do their work. Cause that's going to be a huge piece. Um, I love unwinding anxiety. It's an app that you can use. It is admittedly very expensive. Um, but there's a, I think a seven day free trial and you don't even have to buy the full, um, you can just keep it on, on, on the free app. Um, but that's good because it gives you daily check-ins. The more you can check in with your body and how you're feeling, just dropping in. It's not to relax. That's not it. It's about keeping your prefrontal cortex online. And that's what we need to do with our kids too. So if you're dropping into the body, recognizing, okay, I'm really stressed and I feel that stress in my chest and it's a clenching feeling. And then you really got to pay attention. Is it more on my left or is it more on my right? Okay. It's more on my right. Just by dropping into your body, you're keeping your prefrontal cortex online. And if you're keeping your prefrontal cortex online, you're better able to regulate. And so being able to be more aware of, okay, I'm getting stressed. That's kind of the first key is just that self-awareness. So I love the unwinding anxiety app just for that. Um, other ways, I mean, the typical things just to lower your overall arousal level, breathing, relaxation, all of those things in the moment really don't work but you practicing them proactively is really helpful. Um, the one hack to the amygdala, I, I kind of mentioned that we can't turn that anxiety dial down. We really have zero control over our emotions. Um, the only hack though is exercise. Because if you think your amygdala is triggered, you're in fight flight, what does your body want to do? It wants to run, right? It wants to fight, it wants to run. And so cortisol becomes a problem when we sit. If we sit and grab a bottle of wine and, you know, zone out on Netflix, that's a problem. That's when cortisol is a problem. Cortisol is otherwise very healthy for us. It's actually very helpful for our immune system if we do something physical. So the only hack that I would say to that anxiety dial and to regulate our own emotions is to go do something physical. I know we all know it. It's just figuring out what the barrier is to getting and doing something physical. So even if you just shake, you know, in the moment, if you're feeling like, or, you know, just jump, you see boxers, you know, as they're coming out, they're just shaking off that energy. Shaking is our, is our natural way to calm the nervous system down. So if you've ever had a close call, like a close accident, and you were shaking afterward, that was your nervous system trying to calm itself. So even just doing a little shake can be helpful. So hopefully those ideas are helpful. Okay. Uh, medication. Medication, fantastic for something like ADHD, not for anxiety, though. Um, or depression, to be honest, but for anxiety, um, it becomes a safety behavior. It becomes, so again, no skills are being learned. They're never learning to manage the, the, their anxiety. So the minute they go off medications, they're right back at square one. And they believe I can't function without my medication. So I personally um, would say medication is never a good thing per se. Um, how do you differentiate worry and anxiety? I sometimes find our kids hear anxiety everywhere and can take it on themselves. How do you deal with it becoming a behavior? That's when we're talking about it. We make things a big deal, right? We, we just make it a problem when we're hearing it all the time. So normal worry is the beginning, the middle, and the end. It's just about this one thing and I'm not thinking about it anymore. So maybe I'm worried about um, how people are going to react to my new haircut. 
and then they go to school and they see how everybody reacts and they're not worried about it anymore, right? That's a normal worry. But if they are obsessing and obsessing about were they really saying that they like it? I don't know if they actually really like it. Maybe tomorrow I'm gonna wear a hat and it just keeps going on and on and on. That's where it starts to become more problematic. Um, and, and usually with anxiety, it's there's just so many different things and it's manifesting in, in different behavioral ways, but it's kind of all the time. It's just never really, they never really have uh, going back to baseline calm. They're just always aroused, 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 even at a sort of a low level of arousal. And anxiety interferes with things like sleep. Um, you see avoidant behaviors, you know, that's where it becomes a problem when they're starting to avoid and it's starting to interfere with functioning.